Welcome to our event for World Malaria Day. This annual event is observed on April 25th to raise awareness about the burden of malaria and to promote efforts to control and prevent the disease. This year, we're also raising funds for two highly effective charities that are focused on preventing malaria, which still claims the lives of hundreds of thousands of people every year, mostly children. You see, malaria remains one of the world's most deadly diseases, with over 200 million cases reported annually in over 90 countries. In 2021, the WHO reported that over 600,000 people died from malaria. That number is heartbreakingly high, which is why it's so important to come together and to do what we can to reduce the burden. So today, we're lucky enough to have with us two incredible organizations uh, that are working tirelessly to prevent malaria, the Against Malaria Foundation, and Malaria Consortium. They're at the forefront of malaria control and prevention efforts, working to provide bed nets, treatment and education to those most at risk. Both the Against Malaria Foundation and Malaria Consortium Seasonal Malaria Chemo Prevention Programs represent some of the most highly effective ways of saving and improving lives in the near term. So in 2022, the charity evaluator GiveWell estimated that it costs roughly $5,000 to save a life by supporting these organizations. During this event, we'll have a Q&A session with representatives from both organizations, where we'll ask them some of your questions and gain a deeper understanding of the challenges and solutions in the fight. But before we dive in to hear from AMF and Malaria Consortium, we're going to cover a little bit more about malaria and why this is a problem worth addressing. You see, malaria is a disease that doesn't discriminate. It affects people from all walks of life and it doesn't care if you're rich or poor, young or old. But unfortunately, it is the people who are already disadvantaged that hit the hardest. In fact, malaria is often referred to as a disease of poverty because it disproportionately affects people in low-income countries. So imagine being a parent who can't afford to take their child to a doctor when they're sick, let alone buy them a mosquito net to protect them from malaria or being a farmer who can't work for weeks or even months because they're too sick to do so and can't afford someone else to take over their work. You see, this is the reality for many people living in malaria endemic areas. Over 200 million people contract malaria every year. And for most of those cases, it can cause flu-like symptoms such as fever, chills, and muscle aches. It can also cause nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. In severe cases, however, malaria can cause organ failure, seizures, and even death. The symptoms can be debilitating and they can last for weeks or even months. In fact, the World Health Organization estimate that over 400,000 people die from malaria each year. That is just far too many people. And it's especially bad in Sub-Saharan Africa where most of the cases occur. But it's not just adults that are affected by malaria. In fact, children under the age of five are particularly vulnerable. And even if they survive the disease, they can still suffer long-term effects like cognitive impairment and developmental delays. Now you might be thinking that malaria only affects the health of individuals, but that's not true. These effects filter up and it goes on to affect the entire economies of countries where it's prevalent. Malaria is a leading cause of missed work days and lost productivity, which can be really devastating for countries that are already struggling with poverty. And it even impacts the tourism industry. Fewer tourists are willing to travel to places with malaria which can lead to a decrease in tourism revenue. But there is some good news. There are effective interventions that can help prevent and treat malaria. One of the best ways to prevent malaria is using mosquito nets that have been treated with insecticide. And that's where the Against Malaria Foundation comes in. They provide mosquito nets treated with insecticide to people in need. And if someone does get infected with malaria, there are medications available that can help treat the disease. However, in some areas, access to these medications can be a challenge. And that's why the Malaria Consortium provides seasonal malaria chemo prevention to help prevent the disease. So without further ado, let's welcome our esteemed guests. Good morning, uh, my name is Rob Mather. I'm the founder and the CEO of the Against Malaria Foundation. And my role is to keep us pointing in the right direction and to do as much as we can at AMF to prevent malaria. My name is Olusha Laure Soya and I work with Malaria Consortium as the Senior Country Technical Coordinator. I'm based in Abuja, in Nigeria, and um, my role is to provide technical support and oversight for programs and um, projects that are run in the um, Malaria um, Consortium's portfolio in Nigeria. So, hello everyone, my name is Christian Rossi. 
I am the program director of Malaria Consortium Seasonal Malaria Chemo Prevention Program. I'm based in London and I oversee all of our activities in our Seasonal Malaria Chemo Prevention or SMC program. Uh, currently, we're supporting seven countries on SMC, reaching about 24 million children. So it's uh, by some margin Malaria Consortium's largest program. Uh, Rob, can you describe a little bit more about why malaria chose to focus on bed nets? We focus on bed nets at AMF and have done so for more than 17 years now um, with distributions across some 40 countries, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, as bed nets are either the most effective or certainly at minimum one of the one of, one of the most effective ways of preventing malaria. And, and prevention is better than treatment. Nets prevent malaria-carrying mosquitoes that typically bite between 10 o'clock at night and 2 in the morning from biting those people sleeping under them and therefore from transmitting malaria. So a net is both a mechanical barrier and a chemical barrier as the nets are covered with um, insecticide, pyrethroid insecticide, uh, that is long-lasting, hence we call them long-lasting insecticide-treated nets or LLINs. And one of the great things about these nets is they remain highly effective even in the very challenging environments and households in which they are distributed because nets will often develop nets and rips and tears. But because the malaria carrying mosquito doesn't do an aerobatics maneuver through a hole, it lands on a net and migrates to a hole and in doing so picks up insecticide on its feet, which it then absorbs. Uh, and that causes knockdown, knocks the mosquito down and kills it. Um, so they're very, very effective at stopping malaria transmission. Um, and I should add that the insecticide is perfectly safe for the people uh, sleeping under the nets. And if we look at the impact of the nets in terms of numbers, for every thousand nets uh, our various organizations deliver and deploy, uh, we save one life we avert 500 to 1,000 cases of malaria. And what we also do is we improve the GDP, the productivity of the areas, the local economy, the areas in which we're distributing the nets, because if people are sick, they can't uh, work, they can't teach, they can't drive, they can't farm, they can't function. And this has been modeled, and we're talking about um, roughly $50,000 worth of improved GDP for every 1,000 nets, every four to five thousand uh, dollars that we spend on distributing those nets so uh, the humble bed net uh, if we can call it that which protects two people when they sleep at night um, is a very cost effective way of reducing malaria um, can you talk a bit about the different programs that malaria consortium runs um, and then tell us a bit more about the smc program in particular malaria is um one is a very complex disease that there is no single bullet that you can use against malaria. And so it's usually a multi-pronged approach. And so Malaria Consortium has several interventions that we implement across the different countries that we support in Asia and in Africa. And, you know, we have interventions that are targeted at, you know, improving case management, you know, effective case management of malaria, which involves both diagnosis and treatment of the disease of everyone that has the disease. And this, we have programs that are implemented at the health facility level and also at community level, targeting um, effective case management. We also are involved in um, preventive um, interventions, um, the new intervention, it's not, not really new, um, perennial malaria chemo prevention that just recently came to the front burner um, as a result of the WHO's um, revised guideline um, is currently being piloted in Nigeria to you know, generate evidence that will help the country to take a decision on implementing that as a policy um, recommended intervention and then also help to scale it up later. So Malaria Consortium involves, um, we, we are involved in, you know, taking um, eye impact intervention, trying them out, testing them out, and then taking them to scale 
pill in order to ensure that you know we have um, that universal health coverage that um, we're all looking for. So um, I'll, I'll ask Kristen to talk a little bit more about our SMC program because that's one of the biggest programs that we have running right now. Yes, uh, indeed. Thanks, Shula. So Season Malaria Chemo Prevention, or SMC in short, is Malaria Consortium's largest program. And it's the program that's been awarded top charity status by, by GiveWell. SMC is an intervention that's specifically designed to prevent malaria in young children in areas where malaria transmission is seasonal. So that's areas where malaria cases are low for much of the year, but then the cases increase substantially for a few months every year, uh, typically during the rainy season. SMC involves giving effective antimalarials to children on a regular basis such that they are protected from malaria infection during this high-risk period. And it's typically delivered in the form of mass campaigns, which involve community distributors going door-to-door -to, -door to administer the SMC medicines to children. There's quite a lot of evidence that SMC is a very effective intervention that can prevent around 75% of malaria cases in young children during the high uh, transmission season. Now, Malaria Consortium is a leading implementer of SMC globally. Last year, 2022, we supported the governments of Burkina Faso, Chad, Mozambique, Nigeria, South Sudan, Togo and Uganda to deliver SMC to about 24 million children. That's around half of all the children that were reached with SMC last year globally. Uh, what do you see as some of the greatest strengths of Malaria Consortium and especially the uh, SMC program? Um, because we are a technical organization, we, we pride ourselves in the fact that we, all our interventions are evidence-based. We, we, we're involved in research, we generate um, evidence and our program are based on sound you know, evidence that are you know, well documented. And you know, as I also mentioned earlier, we, we have that ability and the technical know-how, you know, and capacity to try out innovations and take it to scale and you know we have done that over the years with many interventions an example is um, this SMC that um, Christian is talking about and he, he might also be able to say a little bit more when SMC came up as a new intervention we were the first to try it out um, in a, on a small scale and over the years as it's been demonstrated to be an impactful intervention, we have also been able to take it to scale, you know, across several countries um, in Africa. And one of the ways we've been able to do that is because of the trust that we have built with governments of these countries where that we work with over the years. We build trust with them. We've had long-standing, you know, working relationship with them because of the kind of approach that we have um, towards implementing programs. We support programs and we support countries to take the lead in the delivery of those programs. And then that helps them to, you know, own it and to take ownership of those programs. And we have seen them do that across the many countries that, that we support. Rob, over to you with AMF. What do you see some of the biggest strengths uh, uh, over there at AMF and the BetNets program? Probably our greatest strength at AMF is a very simple one, and that's ensuring that nets reach the people who need them. Um, we have a, a, a laser-like focus on making sure that the nets we fund uh, reach beneficiaries in exceptionally high proportions, uh, because at the end of the day, that is what drives the impact of these nets. Um, and I would say that our, our greatest focus um, in that area is on accountability, uh, which for us means collecting household level data across millions and millions of households so that we all know uh, and we can share that nets have reached beneficiaries as intended uh, because we're not going to mess up on the amount of money we raise. Um, the more we can raise, the better. And there are significant gaps in funding, and we might come on to that. But we can certainly all mess up, ourselves and our colleagues at the Malaria Consortium, we can all mess up on, on the operational side and delivering what we're there to deliver. And so all of us as organisations pay huge attention to that part of our work. How do you uh, measure the impact of the interventions and also the effectiveness of the delivery of that? 
Well, we measure impact in, in, a, in a series of ways. Um, first of all, as I, I've alluded to, we, we, we need to start by collecting net need and net distribution data from millions of households. Um, so we know how many nets are needed at each household individually. We don't distribute two households to every uh, household. Uh, two nets to each household, we would distribute two or three or four or one, or depending I exactly what a household needs, because that's a very that's the underpinning of an efficient distribution. And we need to make sure that nets have reached beneficiaries as intended. So that simple what is needed and what has been done in terms of nets being distributed is our, is our first port of call. Um, we also gather post-distribution coverage and usage data um, because during the three-year lifetime of these nets, one does see a drop-off in coverage levels across a population from high 90s percent um, through the 80s and 70s and, and they decline over, over the years. And what we want to do as a whole series of partners, just not just us, but the national health programs we work with, is we want to see coverage remain high. And there are a variety of things we can all do uh, to uh, keep coverage up, because coverage fundamentally equals preventing malaria. And thirdly, we would always pay attention to malaria mortality and illness data, and we track that in all of the areas in which we distribute nets. Albeit, unfortunately, malaria data can be very noisy um, because it's collected in health facilities that don't have um, all of the equipment and the uh, facilities we would want. Uh, and therefore, um, we often fall back on looking at coverage data because, as I say, if you're covering sleeping spaces with nets, we know through a lot of research over more than three decades that if you have nets in place, malaria is reduced. So that combination of of three things is very important for us in in thinking about impacts but we also pay attention to how effective we are at um, deploying funds um, obviously if we can reduce the, the level of overhead within our organization it's not the only thing we look at but if we can reduce that level of overhead then we are directing a greater proportion of the funds that are that are entrusted to us um, to the front line if you like and over the last a uh, decade or so, our overheads have been less than 1%, which means that we're very efficient with uh, deploying uh, donor money. Uh, but we're also very interested in how comprehensive our monitoring is uh, of operations of our programs, and we monitor the living daylights out of everything, really, um, through planning, the registration phase, establishing how many nets are needed by households, and through the distribution phase where we're distributing nets. Um, so we're very keen on c collecting an awful lot of data. Um, so those are some of the ways that we think about how we go about delivering impact. To a malaria consortium team, um, it'd be great to hear uh, your approach to collecting uh, data and uh, measuring the impact of your intervention. Yeah, maybe I can give the example of how we do that uh, within our season malaria chemo prevention program. And it's actually very similar to the approach that, that Rob has just developed. Uh, so we also uh, monitor the, the living daylight out of out of our program. Uh, we have a, a very, very comprehensive indicator framework, which assesses the relationship between the different aspects of SMC implementation. So starting from the inputs that are going into the program. So that's uh, things like the SMC medicines we're procuring. Uh, we're looking at processes we're using. So that could be, for example, the training of SMC implementers. Are we training the right number of implementers? Uh, is the training having the desired effect, etc.? And it looks at outputs uh, such as, as the number of medicines uh, distributed. And then that allows us to look at the expected results or link those um, processes and inputs to the expected results. Coverage for us as well is a very uh, important indicator that, that we measure in terms of, of result. We're also looking at cost, uh, just like Rob has, has explained, and we're also looking at uh, the impact in terms of um, preventing malaria cases, even though, as, as Rob has said, that can be difficult because of the just the, the, the noise around the, the, the data. So the framework also looks at um, external data. So that could, uh, for, for example, be... Uh, climate data, so uh, how rainfall affects the impact of SMC. Now, on 
coverage. Uh, as I said, it's one of our uh, main indicators that we're tracking. So one of the things uh, we do is that we conduct household surveys after the SMC campaigns to uh, measure the proportion of children in a given area that have received SMC. Uh, where we ask the caregivers whether their children have received SMC. And the service also ask a number of questions relating to the quality of SMC delivery. So, for example, if the distributors shared health messages about malaria, uh, which is something they're, they're trained on. So those surveys not only give us a, a reliable measure of the proportion of children we reach, they also allow us to identify areas that may need improvement and corrective action in, in later campaigns. And then finally, as a research organization, we also conduct uh, both primary and secondary research to demonstrate the impact of SMC. So, for example, one of our colleagues is currently doing a PhD project with Imperial College London, where she's drawing on a, on a range of data sources, including large national survey data sets, to calibrate a model to estimate the impact of SMC in terms of preventing malaria cases over time. Malaria is still, you know, a huge disease burden, one of the you know, big killer in the world. Um, but most people in many countries know very little about it. Uh, it would be great to know what you wish the general public in many c countries knew about malaria that it doesn't currently know. It would be great that even more of the general public uh, knew that malaria is fixable um, and that the work we do to fix malaria can be done in a highly efficient and accountable way. And I think if more people knew that, funding would increase. And that's one of the most significant bottlenecks we have as organizations uh, to the work that we want to do. I think a lot of the public do know um, that malaria is a big problem, um, but perhaps that jump to knowing how fixable and how uh, fixable in an accountable way it is, um, is something we're all um, working to try and improve. A lot of people have this opinion about malaria that um, it's just malaria. So when you have this fever, um, especially in endemic countries where they're kind of like almost used to, you know, having malaria. So they have this impression that, oh, it's just malaria. I'll just go to the chemist and pick up something from the, from over the counter and I'll feel okay just in a few minutes. And, and so they trivialize the disease. And it's important that people know that it is not just malaria and that malaria kills. It actually literally kills. And so it's important for people to understand that they need, you know, to access um, preventive interventions, protect themselves from malaria, as well as, you know, um, take necessary steps in seeking treatment as soon as they feel um, they have the symptoms of malaria. Um, it's also important to note that, you know, um, malaria is a very complex um, disease that requires a multi-pronged approach in, you know, dealing with the disease. And, you know, it also requires, you know, tailored approaches, you know, to different contexts. Uh, not not using this one size cap fit all, um, but also, you know, just targeting that intervention, the necessary mix of interventions that are required in specific context to ensure that, you know, we are actually dealing with the disease and based on the epidemiology of the disease and also using the most effective tools that are available and a combination of that, you know, that's um, one thing that it's, it's important for people to know, especially people who are in a position to give towards, you know, raising resources and increasing resources um, for fighting the disease. Um, so we have a question from uh, a member of our SAMI asking, what are your biggest limiting factors to serve more people right now? Um, and what do you need to overcome those factors? Our biggest limiting factor at AMF to protect more people is funding. There are significant gaps in funding for net campaigns globally. Um, and AMF alone has an immediate funding gap of more than $300 million. Um, and we could put those funds to work very quickly and and protect more people. Uh, and while that $300 million sounds like an awful lot of money, and it is, one of the things that is worth mentioning is that every $2 matters. No amount is too small because every additional $2 means we fund an additional net. 
and that net protects another two people and that net is really important for those two people. Um, so whilst the numbers are big, even small contributions from many people makes a dent into these gaps. I think one of the um, biggest limiting factors for us is, is the fact that there is this lack of flexibility in, in donor funds. Um, and that sort of like makes it difficult, you know, for you to innovate, for you to try out new approaches that could improve program delivery. Um, because if you have um, funds that are restricted to a certain intervention and to a, to a particular area, even when you have other areas um, that could complement whatever you're doing, it's difficult to, because of that restriction, you don't have resources to um, intervene in those other areas that could, you know, possibly affect or make, or even make the delivery of, you know, that intervention that you have resources for to be more effective, more efficient um, in the way it is ruled out. For instance, in many of the countries that we serve, the health systems are very weak. And so if you have resources that are targeted just at a particular intervention and is restricted to that intervention, and there are areas within the health system that needs to be strengthened for you to have the right platform to deliver the malaria services that you want to provide, then it becomes difficult because you can't move funds around it quite easily because of that lack of flexibility. So I think, you know, that's one of the limiting factors that we have. Uh, when it comes to the delivery of the work, uh, what partnerships play in the work? Partnerships and, and collaborations are an essential part of, of our work, of all of our work. Um, I'm sure including our colleagues at the Malaria Consortium, none of us can work alone. Um, and I think it's worth remembering that, that, that our primary distribution partner at AMF is, is the country's health system. Um, because that, if you like, the, the health system is the organization, the thousands of people, or at least a portion of the many thousands of people, um, is the organization that carries out both the pre-registration visits to millions of households um, to establish exactly how many nets are needed by each household um, to achieve coverage of all sleeping spaces, and then the subsequent distribution of the nets to those same millions of households. And you need many thousands of health workers across a country to carry out those visits across a period of weeks or months um, because that gathering of data is critical and underpins that efficient second phase, if you like, of the distribution, the distribution of the net. So that's a very important relationship. Um, and our work can uh, not only assist with uh, funding, but also we bring experience in other countries, perhaps using electronic devices to collect household level data and, and not collecting data on paper. Um, and that sort of experience can be brought to bear from one country to the next. And so it very much is a, is, is a partnership. But there is a, a very important second set of, of relationships and partnerships and, that we have, and that is with organizations that carry out independent monitoring. I mentioned our uh, our ruthless focus on monitoring the living daylights out of everything. Um, and it's very important to do so because we need to start at that planning phase when we're working with governments and national malaria control programs uh, and sitting both literally and metaphorically around a, a circular table. We're not there with our monitoring partners to, to check up on people in the sense of, of trying to find fault and, and blame, but as a true partner to understand that the right resources, scheduling, priorities are being brought to bear in that planning phase because it is the planning phase that is so crucial in underpinning what is going to happen um, during the distribution. Uh, so we work with independent monitoring partners that we pay. Uh, we fund that work um, to do this monitoring of the planning phase, but then also uh, the household registration phase and the distribution phase. And we gather lots of data through those phases because it is, it is the data that talks to us. We're not interested in stories, we're interested in data. Um, we often say to people, very politely, um, perhaps I paraphrase by saying, please don't ask us to trust you, um, because we won't. Um, not in an offensive way, but what we wish to focus on is, is the data. Um, uh, trust is interesting, but data is, is key. Um, and we also work with partners 
uh, during the post-distribution monitoring phase. So we will go back to a material number of households, 9, 18 and 27 months after nets have been distributed. Uh, remember nets last about three years, so 36 months. And we go to 1.5% of the households that have received nets, randomly selected um, and visited unannounced because what we're interested in is uh, data on a significant scale that can uh, inform us as to net presence, use uh, and condition. And that's very important information because we want to know not just the coverage of a population immediately after we've distributed nets, but um, how that coverage changes over time. And that gives us information that can be actionable by local uh, malaria health leaders um, and at quite a, a, a local and granular level as well given the granularity of the data that we collect. Um, so when we're thinking about partnerships with uh, organizations in country we look at a series of criteria that perhaps are the, are the natural ones you would look at. We're looking at relevant experience in carrying out similar work um, and indeed at a very high standard so we look for data and evidence of that. We particularly look for organizational leadership leadership of an organization is extremely important if not because things don't necessarily always go to plan we're working in very challenging environments and so the nature and character of the person or people leading uh, these organizations these partners of ours is extremely important to us so we spend a lot of time going through that uh, evaluation process and you won't be surprised to hear we look at an overall attitude to accountability the experience within the wider team um, there's a lot of groundwork that goes into um, selecting these partners, um, not least because we're going to work with them in all likelihood over many years, not just the uh, perhaps the three years of one cycle of a net distribution, but in subsequent cycles. And so we see it as a, um, a very necessary and important part of our work um, in selecting really good organizations and hoping where, where we can, hoping to bring um, capacity building and uh, learning from other countries that we've gone through to these new countries. So there's a, uh, sometimes there's a rather wonderful cross fertilization in bringing um, some of the things we've learned to share with our partners and that makes us all better. Shola or Christian, would you guys like to speak to the role that partners uh, play in the delivery of the Malaria Consortium programs? Given the complexity of malaria and the need for, you know, a multi-sectoral approach um, in combating the disease, the, you, we cannot overemphasize the role of partnership and, and collaboration in, in the delivery of malaria interventions. And so for us, all, all relevant sectors, you know, must come on board. Um, according to their areas of strength. And that's what we do at Malaria Consortium for all our interventions. We engage um, stakeholders. We look out for partners who are doing the same thing, who have the same goal, who have the same vision, and we work with them um, across all the countries um, where we operate. And one of the ways we do that is, is to first of all map all the relevant um, key players in, in the area that we are intervening to identify who they, who they are and also be able to classify them according to their importance, their level of, level of importance, their influence, and you know be able to then target them um, and engage with them um, depending on where they are categorized because there are some partner, I mean, there are some stakeholders that um, may not necessarily, you know, um, be in the space, but they can be influential and they can have a lot of impact on whatever it is that you are deploying. And you also need to carry them along um, in a way and in, in some form. Many of them are security challenged areas. They are complex implementing environments where you have to also involve, you know, security agents. You have to really, you know, look at security outfits, also bring them on board in the planning. So when you're planning um, um, interventions, um, especially SNC, um, because it requires people going into the community, there's a lot of community mobilization that goes into that, a lot of community sensitization, a lot of, you know, engaging with the community and getting them to understand that this is going to happen, getting them to be in the driver's seat and owning the intervention and also even making demand for the intervention as 
the intervention is rolled out. Partnership and collaboration is very important in the delivering the interventions we do effectively, efficiently, and also in being able to reach all the key beneficiaries that we are targeting. It'd be great to hear a little bit about how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted the fight against malaria and uh, how you guys have all responded to this and how things are looking now. So fortunately, COVID has had really a, a, only a marginal and, and temporary impact on, on operations, i.e. the distribution of nets, with primarily some delays um, and some adjustments through 2020 and 2021 in particular focused on reducing the chance of transmission. We did have a period, we all had a, a sort of quite a nervous period for several weeks when we were waiting to hear what ministers of health would decide in terms of the continuance of net distribution programs. Um, but I'm pleased to say that um, it was very quickly realized, um, many voices from the, the WHO and, and other organizations um, fed in their thoughts um, that were quite strongly in favor of net distribution programs continuing because I think we're all aware that uh, the impact of COVID was worse in a comorbidity situation and what we didn't want to have happen is malaria rates to increase because that was li likely to exacerbate the impact of, of, of COVID. Um, there were some sensible changes in, in, in ways that we went about our distribution. So one uh, important example would be the way we move to a contemporaneous household registration and net distribution, uh, which as you can imagine, uh, worked to reduce pretty much by a factor of two, the interactions between people when distributing nets. Um, the use of PPE and hand washing and, and other mechanisms were also uh, very important. So some delays were experienced um, in carrying out distributions, some tweaks in the operations. We did also see some fairly significant and eye-watering increases in costs. Uh, so uh, a shipping container that will contain between 30 and 40,000 nets um, in normal times costs about $1,500 and that rose to uh, 12,000 to $18,000. So as much as 15 times as much. Fortunately at AMF, we don't fund shipping. Our co-funding partners pay for that part of um, our work that we do together. But of course, um, it has an impact on the money that's going towards malaria control. So we're all concerned about that sort of increase. Um, fortunately, we're pretty much all getting back to normal now. So marginal, temporary impacts, um, getting back to normal, I'm pleased to say. Yeah, there are, a lot, of course, a lot of parallels between the work that the Against Malaria Foundation do and that we do, especially on SMC, because both Betna distribution and SMC are implemented as mass campaigns. So a lot of the, the challenges uh, sound uh, very familiar to us. Uh, certainly, the uh, the pandemic has presented us with some, some very uh, novel challenges. Um, we also, just like Rob explained, we also came to the conclusion very early on when the pandemic started that it was absolutely essential that we continue to implement SMC campaigns because cancelling SMC would have meant that uh, there would have been an increase in malaria cases, uh, which could have overburdened the health systems that were already stretched uh, because of the pandemic. Now, to keep SMC going and to minimize the risk for, for everyone involved in the campaign, we, we had to make quite a few adaptations to how we deliver SMC. So, for example, we scheduled more training events so we could limit the number of participants per event. Uh, we uh, tried to facilitate physical distancing by encouraging the caregivers of the children to administer the medicines to their children while the community distributors supervise from a safe distance. And also, we, we procured quite large quantities of COVID-19 related commodities, so for example, face masks, hand sanitizer, and, and made those available to, to SMC implementers. Now, as, as Rob described, that has led to an increase in, in costs, especially in terms of procurement, but we've also experienced very similar issues in terms of increased costs and, and some limited capacity to, uh, to ship commodities across, across the world to, to where they're needed for, for SMC. 
Now, at the same time, though, we've also found that SMC could be a very useful platform to share public health information among communities. So we have used the community distributors who go door to door to distribute SMC to also share messages about COVID-19, infection prevention and control. And we have done some studies that have shown that that has actually increased uh, the, the, the the knowledge of how to protect uh, themselves from from COVID-19 among among caregivers. Where we are right now, so we still think that SMC, uh, uh, that, that we need to include a level of uh, protection for SMC implementers in SMC, uh, but we're, we're moving to a much more risk-based approach where in many areas where COVID cases are quite low, the disease is endemic, we're going back to more or less uh, uh, sort of business as usual, but there are still areas where um, the, the caseload is, is higher, where we are still implementing sort of increased um, safety and, and, and security measures and infection and prevention and control measures. So in 2020, a lot of people were worried that philanthropy would get hit quite hard by COVID, but the sector, people did respond. Um, and 2021 was quite strong financially because of money being pumped into the system. But as 2022 uh, hit, inflation started to set in, economic conditions got a bit tougher. How have things been uh, from you, uh, your guys' perspective in terms of the funding landscape uh, for malaria? 2022, 2021, 22 have been pretty good um, for MF. Um, uh, I guess, you know, a headline number is, is that over those years, we grew from $38 million coming into our organization to 107 and then $120 million coming in. Um, we received some significant grants uh, from GiveWell, but also saw our underlying donations from um, sort of people like us, if I can put it that way, giving $10 and two euros and 30 Swiss francs also growing. And I think that is because those individuals who are particularly drawn to and are aware of the sort of interventions that we're involved in and the Malaria Consortium are involved in, um, it is a, a relatively small proportion of the people who perhaps will become knowledgeable about what we do and therefore perhaps there is a significant uh, there's significant room for growth so so far we have seen I'm very pleased to say um, terrific support um, many many people continuing to support the work we do year after year we have a particular policy if you like or approach at AMF where we don't market we don't go out and ask people for money. Um, our preference is to focus more ruthlessly on the work we do operationally um, and hope that uh, people will look critically at the work we do and the results we get and continue to support us. And to date that has worked. Uh, as I mentioned, we have very significant um, gaps in funding. Um, so it's not as though any of us are sitting here um, at either organization here today thinking that we, you know we're doing okay and we can continue to grow there is such a need um, that you know our efforts if you like you know redouble you know on a regular basis because we want to fill those gaps we have been receiving uh, throughout the last couple of years uh, very very substantial support including from the effective altruism community for our smc program for other activities that malaria consortium is implementing as, a, as well and that has continued through the economic downturn over the last year or so as well having said that it has affected us uh, to a certain extent because uh, the, so the the reduced funding that's available globally has led to sort of a, a re-evaluation of some of the sp specific areas or geographies that we support that maybe no longer meet the very strict cost effectiveness threshold that um, philanthropic donors apply where we still believe that SMC is very much uh, a, a needed intervention and in general as Rob said there is a, there's a, an immense need for for funding uh, in the malaria space not just for SMC not just for BetNet but for for a range of, of malaria interventions there's never enough funding but again having said that we are extremely grateful for the the immense support that we've uh, we've seen and received over the last few years especially from the effective altruism community well, I'm aware we're almost at time. So thank you all so much for your time today. I really hope that um, this and, and this, uh, not just this event, but also just in general, we're able to continue building support. It's really important work. It's 
um, something I've cared about for a very long time <laughs> and really wanting to see us make more progress on. So thank you all for the work you do. It's really important. Thank you to everyone who joined us today for this important event for World Malaria Day. We hope you learned a lot about the burden of malaria and the incredible work that the Against Malaria Foundation and Malaria Consortium are doing to prevent and treat this deadly disease. As we wrap up, we want to encourage everyone to consider making a donation to these two fantastic organisations. Every dollar donated can help provide a bed net or a medication to prevent and treat malaria. We know that many of you are passionate about this cause, and we hope that you will consider donating to help make a difference. Remember, malaria is a disease of poverty that affects millions of people every year, especially those in low-income countries. By supporting the work of AMF and Malaria Consortium, you're helping save lives and improve the health and well-being of people around the world. So please head over to our fundraiser and make a donation via us or one of our partners across the world. Thank you again for joining us today and we hope you will continue to support the fight against malaria. Together, we can make a difference and help end this deadly disease once and for all. Thank you. <laughs>